Good afternoon. I'm uh, Congressman Dennis Kucinich, Chairman of the Domestic Policy Subcommittee of the Committee on Oversight and Government Reform. The Committee will now come to order. Uh, with me here is the Ranking Member of the Committee, the Honorable Darrell Issa of California, and he and I will be uh, participating in this hearing, examining the environmental issues presented when water bottling plants extract groundwater and spring water from water sources in rural communities. Now, without objection, the Chair and the Ranking Minority Member will have five minutes to make opening statements, followed by opening statements not to exceed three minutes by any other member who seeks recognition. And without objection, members and witnesses may have five legislative days to submit a written sta <coughs> statement or extraneous materials for the record. I've long had an interest in issues relating to uh, water and water supplies. Matter of fact, in a uh, spring 2006 issue of uh, Waterkeeper magazine, I wrote a piece uh, explaining my concerns about uh, the annexation and overuse of waters uh, in Lake Erie and the Great Lakes, which is the largest source of fresh water in, uh, in, in this country. And uh, without objection, I'd, I'd like to submit that article uh, for the record. Uh, now, if we give any real thought when opening a bottle of spring water, maybe it's to congratulate ourselves on our healthy choice or to dream of a shrinking waistline. But it may come as a surprise that virtually every aspect of the bottling industry's extraction of groundwater, how much water to pump and from where to pump it, the effects of pumping on the surrounding environment, and who should have the authority to make pumping decisions, all these things are often hotly contested. For a variety of reasons, bottled water is not uh, like any other commodity, and the protection of our nation's groundwater, often understood as held in public trust, involves many crucial interests of public interest, many crucial issues of public interest. Some of these issues will not be our main focus today, such as concerns about bottled water quality, the profit earned off water even as public water infrastructure is neglected, damage caused by the manufacture and disposal of the bottles, the propriety of, of uh, transferring water resources out of a region or out of a country. Instead, we will focus on the environmental effects of bottling on local communities. The domestic bottled water industry, which includes both distilled municipal water and spring water, has seen remarkable growth. Last year, Americans spent more than $10 billion on bottled water which translates to an average annual consumption of 27 gallons per person, double the amount consumed just five years ago. This growth has been a boon to the industry. The largest bottler is Nestle Waters of North America, which through rapid industry consolidation now controls 32 percent of the domestic market through its 14 different brands. Because of the growing market for bottled water, bottlers are constantly looking for untapped watersheds in relatively undeveloped rural communities which disproportionately bear the brunt of pumping's environmental impact. As our groundwater hydrologist will explain, for every gallon of water pumped out of the groundwater, there is one gallon of water lost to streams in the watershed. If the pumped water is not recharged, there is a real danger of what could be called groundwater mining, which the U.S. Geological Service describes as, quote, a prolonged and progressive decrease in the amount of water stored in a groundwater system, unquote. Moreover, high-capacity bottled water extraction in headwater locations can cause large percentage reductions in the flow of streams and rivers and the depletions of watersheds. Bottlers may seek out private landowners or directly contract with a municipality to obtain groundwater rights for years or decades. The issue is complicated by the fact that many rural communities have an interest in the economic activity that's been promised by the water bottlers, and indeed some communities support the location of bottling plants. Obviously, aside from the pure economic incentives, certain interests of the water bottling industry are aligned with those of the local communities. Both have an interest in protecting the pristine water sources. In other respects, however, these interests of bottlers and communities may diverge, such as the downstream effects on surface waters or the long-term visions of development and conservation. Today, we will hear from representatives of citizens groups that have opposed the location of bottling plants in their communities on the slopes of Mount Shasta in California in Michigan and in rural New Hampshire. They've often been frustrated by a com complex patchwork of laws that they believe does not adequately protect the public interest. Traditionally, the vast majority of groundwater is, uh, uh, consumption is used for agriculture, mining, and non-bottled municipal water 
and groundwater use has been mainly regulated by the states. Under common law, groundwater has largely been regarded as a resource that can be extracted by anyone who owns the land above an aquifer or a spring. The common law was formulated before modern science understood the connections between groundwater and surface water and before the advent of large-scale mechanized pumping. As a result, it provides little protection for conservation. Given the toothless nature of the common law, it is not surprising that states have enacted more comprehensive regulatory systems governing groundwater extraction. These come in a variety of forms. Some states, like New Hampshire, have enacted comprehensive laws, and we'll also hear about new legislation passed in Maine and Michigan. These laws, at best, address the connection between groundwater and surface waters, mandate participation among those affected by pumping, and call for increasing levels of security for larger withdrawals. At worst, state laws are woefully inadequate. Although groundwater management is mostly a state concern and many of the important decisions about locating a particular plant are local, the federal government does have a role. For years, scientists and policymakers have called on better funding for the U.S. Geological Service so they can map and monitor groundwater and its connection to surface water. The federal government could, but generally hasn't, taken other steps to prod the states to better groundwater management. There is also the issue whether federal agencies adequately enforce federal protections, such as the Clean Water Act, the Wild and Scenic Rivers Act, and the Environmental Protection Act, that are triggered when surface waters are imperiled by groundwater extraction. Finally, there is a concern that the Food and Drug Administration's definition of spring water, which purports to ensure water quality, actually creates incentives for pumping at the most environmentally damaged sites, as far, or damaging sites. As far as I'm aware, this is the first congressional hearing on many of these issues, and it is my hope that the hearing, hearing will help reform uh, uh, the, the hearing will help the reform process at all levels of government. So thank you, and at this time, uh, I'd like to recognize uh, Congressman Issa, the ranking member. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, what most of you who aren't here regularly don't know is that the, the chairman and myself have uh, have been able to very effectively find issue after issue we agree on. Uh, when I say we agree on, we agree on the issues. We do not always agree on the outcome or the view. Uh, the chairman and I have been able to work together very well on finding good issues. This is certainly one. In this case, I find it unfortunate that perhaps we're not looking at the underlying problem of bad portable, po potable water coming from our taps. That's probably my greatest concern here today, uh, and we're not going to talk about it. Perhaps an ancillarily over time, we will begin working on the issue, for example, here in the District of Columbia. If this water, as I suspect it did, did not come from a bottle and simply being disguised by being put into uh, this carafe, but in fact came out of the tap, please don't drink it. The amount of lead in our water is such that on a repeated basis, each generation is told the previous generation didn't do enough. We've relined. We've done all kinds of things, but at the end of the day, and my staff behind me reminded me, the District of Columbia recently sent Brita filters out to take care of the accumulation of lead you will have if you drink that water. This is a problem in the District of Columbia and around the country. Earlier in the previous Congress, <coughs> we dealt with arsenic. Dealing with arsenic meant essentially the pumps in New Mexico and other places were shut off and people were forced to bring their water in from other areas. We have a serious problem of delivering quality drinking water, consumable water in this country. To a lesser degree, we have a problem delivering water for non-drinking purposes. Mr. McFarlane, I appreciate the fact you're from Shasta. I'm a Southern Californian. It is no surprise that Southern California, accused of killing fish and stealing water from the North, might at times recognize that California is, if you will, ground zero for this problem. Northern California has over four times the rain and snowfall that Southern California has. Well, Southern California has a majority of the population. Notwithstanding the attempts to build canals and to move water from the north to the south, far greater than all the bottled water that's being taken out of groundwater in California, far greater. And as a result, we can assume that what doesn't go into the ground in Northern California and comes through peripheral and other canals doesn't go into the groundwater. California has been having this argument 
for in excess, well, I came to California, I'll be honest, came to California in the 70s. It was the hot topic then. It is the hot topic today. Realizing that <coughs> these problems in California and around the country will not easily be solved, I am an advocate <coughs> for any system that guarantees healthy drinking water for our citizens. I have questions for today that will not be answered. Ms. Paul, I'm not letting you off the hook. I still can't figure out why between drinking water and uh, Starbucks coffee, gasoline seems like a deal from OPEC. There is a high cost of delivery of water through uh, little bottles and so on, and I think that is a problem. The chairman pointed out in his opening statement that the question of disposal of tens of millions of little plastic bottles, not just every year but every month, is a real problem in America. The need to come up with an aggressive recycling plan, the need to, if not regulate, certainly ensure that bottled water and other forms of water delivered around the public uh, systems are at or greater in quality to those that can be received from the tap. I thank the chairman for his bringing up this point today because it does open a dialogue for the first time by this committee and as far as I know for the first time recently in Congress to the fact that safe drinking water, affordable drinking water and sustainable aquifers around the country are in peril. So although I, I mentioned everything that, I, that wasn't in today's committee hearing, you have to begin somewhere. I commend the chairman for beginning. Uh, the process. I'm sure that when we review the notes of today, we will find far more available to us to digest than I'm talking about here today. And hopefully, in time, we will hit all of the issues leading to America drinking high quality water. Uh, and in closing, I'll note that the chairman and I are both native Clevelanders. So uh, I share the fact that the, the Great Lakes are the greatest body of fresh water available on the planet and that very much we need to look at that as a resource that's carefully managed. I yield back. I, I want to thank uh, my partner in this committee, uh, Mr. Iser, for his comments. And in response, I just want you to know that uh, this is a beginning. I would like to be responsive to uh, what you suggest is looking at uh, questions of uh, the potability, potability of, wa of water, drinking water in this country, as, as well as uh, looking at the uh, questions of water quality generally, uh, both for um, drinking and non-drinking purposes, as well as the uh, issues related to uh, plastic um, or bottled drinking water. I also want to say that, uh, and I appreciated you mentioning Cleveland because, as I indicated in my opening remarks, uh, the issues relating to Lake Erie and protecting that drinking water and protecting the volume of the water uh, are also, you know, I know of concern to states like California because the access to water in your state is, is a serious issue as well. So I want to work with you in, uh, in making this the first of perhaps many hearings we could have on this issue of water, and I appreciate the gentleman's comments very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Appreciate it. If there are no additional opening statements, the subcommittee will now receive testimony from the witnesses before us today. Uh, we will hear from Mr. Richard McFarland, who is a founding member of the McLeod Watership, uh, Watershed Council, a nonprofit community based organization providing stewardship and advocacy for the McLeod River watershed in the Mount Shasta region of California. In addition to his advocacy, Mr. McFarland is president of Teramai, a pioneer in, green build, in the green building movement, which uses recycled lumber for its building projects. He's also worked as a professional river guide and an expedition leader. Uh, next, we'll hear from uh, Ms. Terry, is it Sweer? Uh, Ms. Sweer is the founder and president of the Michigan Citizens for Water Conservation, a nonprofit grassroots organization of over 1,900 members. Ms. Sweer has helped educate state legislators and members of Congress on the Nestle water issue and has raised the public's awareness of the importance of water diversion and, and export. In addition to her environmental work, Ms. Sweer recently retired after 30 years as a university librarian. Uh, next, it will be uh, Mr. Uh, Bill McCann. 
He serves as on the board of director, directors of Save Our Groundwater and is chairman of the organization's committee on legislative and governmental issues. Founded in 2001 in response to a bottled, uh, a bottled water company's attempt to draw from a local aquifer, Save Our Groundwater is a New Hampshire seacoast area citizens action organization dedicated to protecting water in the public trust. Mr. McCann has also been a New Hampshire state representative where he served on a resources recreation and development committee. And finally, Ms. Heidi Paul. Uh, Ms. Paul has been Vice President of Corporate Affairs for Nestle Waters North America since 2000. Ms. Paul is responsible for all aspects of the company's corporate communications and community relations. Before taking this post in 2000, Ms. Paul was the Director of Brand Management for Nestle Waters. She is also Chairman of the Project uh, WET, a not-for-profit organization involved with international water education. I want to thank each of the witnesses for appearing before our subcommittee today. And it is the policy of the Committee on Oversight and Government Reform to swear in all witnesses before they testify. I would ask that uh, you rise and to raise your right hand. <coughs> Do you solemnly swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Thank you. Let the record reflect that the witnesses answered in the affirmative. I ask that each of the witnesses now give a brief summary of their testimony and to keep this summary under five minutes in duration. I'd like you to bear in mind that your complete written statement will be included in the, in the record of the hearing. So, um, okay, let's begin with uh, Mr. McFarland. If you would uh, begin your testimony and address the chair, we appreciate your presence here. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman Kucinich. My name is Richard McFarland. My wife Erica and I settled in McLeod, California 20 years ago. We started a small reclaimed lumber business which has grown considerably and is currently the largest private employer in our small town of 1800. We started a family and our three sons are also growing rapidly. McLeod sits at the base of 14,000 foot Mount Shasta, a dormant volcano that dominates the landscape in far northern California and draws visitors from around the world. Mount Shasta's glacier and snow melt feed the McLeod River, a hydrogeologically unique, crystal clear, ice cold stream well known as a world class trout fishery. It's a major tri tributary of the Sacramento River, the backbone of California's public water system. McLeod is a former lumber company town. The McLeod Community Services District provides our de facto city government. We're blessed with spring-fed municipal water supply that provides exceptional quality, untreated cold spring water to every tap in town. When I settled here in 1987, McLeod was economically depressed and was in a general state of disrepair. Most of the buildings downtown were dilapidated or boarded up. In the past two decades, there's been significant capital investment in McLeod. One old timer recently told me that the town has never looked better. To the objective visitor, McLeod would appear to be thriving. In the fall of 2003, during a public meeting, the 100 year contract selling our water to Nestle was both announced and approved. We had assumed that this hearing was going to be the beginning of a public process. In fact, it was the culmination of backroom negotiations between Nestle and a few local politicians and public servants. This triggered a series of events. A three-year lawsuit which resulted in the contract being thrown out by our county superior court and later reinstated by an appellate court. Nestle serving harassing and intimidating subpoenas on local community members including myself, a draft environmental impact report, environmental assessment that generated an astounding 4,000 comments, most of them opposed to the project, the development of the Siskiyou County Water Network and the Siskiyou County Protect Our Waters Coalition. The Mount Shasta area is already home to four other bottling plants, already pumping unlimited groundwater. The scale of the proposed Nestle project raises serious concerns about cumulative impacts to Mount Shasta's unique volcanic ground and spring water systems. 
California lacks comprehensive statewide groundwater legislation. Sound policy requires that groundwater management be based on science. This is a state and national water policy issue. I respectfully request the following of the subcommittee. Please consider federal support for state and local efforts to protect community water resources. Specifically helpful would be United States Geological Survey scientific inquiry to monitor and characterize Mount Shasta's ground and surface water resources. This is especially important in the face of potential climate change impacts on California's water supply. Please ensure that the United States Forest Service completes an environmental impact statement for the Nestle project in McLeod. The pipelines for the project travel through several miles of United States Forest Service land on public easements intended for municipal use. Please consider investigating the practices and impacts of Nestle and other large water bottlers in McLeod and other small rural communities around our country. Please consider enacting legislation or policies that protect the significant investment that taxpayers and ratepayers have made in our public water supply infrastructure from corporate exploitation. And finally, please consider investigating the negotiation process that led to the contract between the McLeod Community Services District and Nestle Waters of North America. Thank you very much for hearing my testimony today. Thank you, Mr. McFarland. Uh, Ms. Sweer. Okay, thank you. It has been seven years since the residents of Macosta County, Michigan were made aware of Nestle's plan to pump over 250 million gallons of spring water per year from a private hunting preserve, divert it through 12 mile pipeline that crosses streams and wetlands to its plant, bottle it and then truck it outside the Muskegon River watershed and the Great Lakes Basin under the brand name Ice Mountain. As Nestle moved into Michigan to privatize our water for its own profit, it announced that, would, that there would be no adverse resource impact to the natural resources. Then in December 2000, about 100 citizens met and Michigan Citizens for Water Conservation, MCWC, a nonprofit grassroots corporation was formed. MCWC's mission is and has been to conserve, preserve, and protect the waters and natural resources and public trust in those resources of Michigan and the Great Lakes. MCWC has grown to over 1,900 members and continues to work on water preservation and conservation issues with other organizations. MCWC began at the local level asking our elected township officials to place a moratorium on the Nestle product project to give us time to investigate and evaluate a proposal of this magnitude for the potential impact on neighboring wells, lakes, streams, wetlands, wildlife, and the community's quality of life. Elected officials did not hear or listen to our voices. This eventually led MCWC to three petition drives on rezoning ordinance and to three courts the Macosta County Circuit Court, the Michigan Court of Appeals, and the Michigan Supreme Court. The findings of harm from Nestle's pumping remain intact and unaffected in all three courts. MCWC believed then, and it now has been proven, that irreparable harm would occur to the waterways due to pumping by Nestle at the Sanctuary Spring site. Nestle's pumping has caused harm to the dead stream by reducing the flow and level, narrowing the stream, exposing mud flats, and restricting the enjoyment of many of the members of MCWC and the public for fishing, boating, and kayaking on the stream. The findings of fact are in the court records that Nestle's pumping has created and will continue into the future to create adverse impacts to riparian uses and rights. What will this ancient marsh watershed area, including Thompson Lake, be like for future generations? The lives of the 1,900 members, including the plaintiffs, those who live on the Tri-Lakes, and mine, 
have changed since Nestle came to Michigan. The issue has pitted neighbor against neighbor, friendships have been severed, and Nestle has violated our lives either directly or indirectly with telephone polling, private investigators, the FBI coming to, home, to our home, and a potential strategic, strategic lawsuit against public participation, a slap suit against my son. MCWC has spent nearly a million dollars on the lawsuit against Nestle. We continue to hold fundraisers such as bake sales and garage sales to continue to pay our legal and environmental bills. Nestle has affected families emotionally, physically, mentally, and financially. MCWC believes much of what it has done and stands for is supported by a majority of Michigan citizens. Michigan purports to be a good neighbor company to our area, yet it continued to pump at high rates during a low period of low participation and lower recharge. Even when bottled bottom land and other dramatic impacts and damages to the bedstream, Thompson Lake, and wetlands have occurred. Nestle has continued to pump. Nestle was cautioned by the trial judge that it proceed its own risk in building its plant in Stanwood. True to form, Nestle pushed ahead in building its plant and can continue to use the possible loss of jobs as ways to push through, push through with its lobbyists in Lansing to get to the government governor and her staff and legislators to side with an international company and not the citizens. Water grabbers like Nestle undermine the interest of our sixth generation residents who live on the lakes and streams, the public that fishes, boats, swims, and enjoys our lakes and streams, farmers who rely on our groundwater, and industry and our economy that are so dependent on our water. Water is our heritage and our culture. It must be true protected for our future generations. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. McCann. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good afternoon. Bring that mic close, that's good. Okay. Yeah, uh, good afternoon. Thanks, Bill. My name is Bill McCann, and I'm a member of the Board of Directors of Save Our Groundwater, which is located in Barrington, New Hampshire. I am a resident of the adjoining city of Dover, uh, the seventh oldest settlement in the United States, having been settled in 1623. And I'm also a member of the Conservation Commission in Dover, as well as a former state representative. Last spring, I submitted to this committee a document entitled Analysis of the New Hampshire Department of Environmental Services reversal from its previous denials of a large groundwater permit for USA Springs on behalf of both Save Our Groundwater and a spin-off group called Neighborhood Guardians. I trust that at some point that will be entered into the record and the members of the committee will have an opportunity to review it. What transpired in Barrington was a private corporation coming into the community with their goal of extracting over 400,000 gallons of water a day. What transpired, and I can speak to this as someone who was involved when we passed New Hampshire's law, was the first uh, implementation of RSA 485C, which was New Hampshire's Groundwater Protection Act. And this was the, by far the largest withdrawal that came under the jurisdiction of this law. And I and other citizens in the area watched very carefully to see what was happening because uh, we thought the groundwater would be protected. What we saw was our state government and some federal agencies not implement what we had anticipated. We had expected that there would be protections for the environment, protections for prime wetlands, protections for the people who live in the area. Barrington and Nottingham are located in the southeast portion of New Hampshire, equal distance from Concord and Portsmouth. All of their households rely on private wells for all their potable water. There is no town water system. These communities, like Dover, are old. Uh, both were settled with around 1719 to 1722. 
They have a rural nature. They try to work hard to protect their citizens, a total of about 11,000 people live in the two communities. What happened in this instance was a failure by state government and federal agencies to protect the groundwater. This company uh, is, a, as I said, a privately held company whose business plan said they're going to bottle this water and ship it overseas. In other words, take it out of the aquifer, have no impact, there will be no recharge in New Hampshire, it will have a definite uh, impact on the quality of surface water. Uh, the Lamprey River, which is nearby, is a federally protected uh, water basin. So we anticipated that between our state government and our federal government that uh, steps would be taken to protect. At first, it seemed to work. The permit was denied in 2003. It was denied a second time later in 2003, but then they reapplied for a new permit at the end of 2003, and six months later, the permit was conditionally approved. I can tell you from firsthand experience, a lot of people in the area of the southeastern portion of New Hampshire became very uh, disenfranchised with what government was doing to protect their precious water resource. They expect and they still do expect that the state government or the federal government or some combination of the two will work to protect the aquifer and the water resources in our state and hopefully in other states. Because I'm sure, as we've heard from these other witnesses, we're not the only ones impacted. We are impacted because we don't know right now when this plant will start operation. There are people who are concerned that when that plant starts to operate, they're gonna get up in the morning and find they don't have water. They don't have any reassurance from our Department of Environmental Services or from the Army Corps of Engineers or any other federal agency like EPA that there is protection in place for this uh, possibility. So they are very concerned that this uh, particular situation with USA Springs, as I say, a privately held company, we don't know what will transpire once the plant is built. They're in the process of doing it. They're building the plant even though they have not received final approvals on their wetlands permits and there are appeals pending. The only thing they used for their basis to continue forward is they did get a Supreme Court case to go in their, their way in 2006, but when the state issued the permit, there were 10 conditions. They haven't been met yet, and I hope that this committee can take a look at the situation and maybe be able to assist the people of New Hampshire as well as the rest of the country from having problems like this in the future. Thank you. Thank, <coughs> thank you very much, Mr. McCann, Ms. Paul. Hello, Chairman Kucinich. Thank you for the opportunity to appear before the subcommittee today. My name is Heidi Paul. I'm Vice President of Corporate Affairs of Nestle Waters North America. Nestle Waters bottles and sells 15 regional brands of bottled water, including Deer Park and Poland Spring. We employ 9,000 employees in North America, and we have plants in 21 communities in the U.S. and two in Canada. We have been invited today to testify about the environmental effects of bottled water on groundwater and our operations and communities. Bottled water represents 0.02% of groundwater used. As a company, our use is sensitive to the environment and very efficient. We bottle a very healthy beverage. Not including bottled water, there are close to 75,000 different types and sizes of containerized beverages for sale in America. Most have calories, coloring, chemicals, alcohol, or caffeine. In 2006 alone, Americans avoided 356 billion calories because they switched from soft drinks to bottled water. Today, Americans consume twice the amount of calories from beverages as they did a generation ago. Childhood obesity is up 370% in the last 30 years, and at this rate, 25% of our children and 75% of our adults will be overweight or obese by 2015. Part of the solution to this epidemic 
is to drink more water, tap or bottled. And bottled water has another important social role. For those who have ever lived through a natural disaster or other interruption of water service, including the hurricanes in Florida, ice storms in Maine, 9-11, Katrina, wildfires in California, floods in the Midwest, bottled water is the safety net to the most critical need of all, potable drinking water. Bottled water is also easier on the environment than any of these other beverages. It uses less water and it uses less plastic. And when it comes to collecting the, and bottling spring water, Nestle Waters has an inherent interest in being a steward of a healthy environment at our spring sites. Our spring sources and the facilities that use them represent our most valuable investment. And using springs in a responsible manner today is the only way to ensure our continued success. Moreover, we select only those sites with a safe and sustainable yield. Measuring any effects of our withdrawal and understanding the cumulative impacts of all water users in a shared supply. It is appropriate that communities would have questions and concerns about our water use and other impacts on the community's quality of life, both in terms of opportunities like jobs and challenges like truck traffic. For example, in Michigan, there were concerns about the water use impact. In fact, it went to court. As Ms. Swire mentioned, Michigan courts ruled that bottled water is a proper and beneficial use of water in Michigan, and the company has the right to withdraw water at an appropriate rate determined under the state's reasonable use balancing test. Following a court of appeals ruling, the company and project opponents engaged in mediated negotiations to determine the allowable rate of water use. Data reflects that this is a very safe level. In McLeod, California, we are in the middle of a comprehensive environmental and community-based regulatory process. In response to concerns, we are engaged with environmental groups, concerned citizens, together with third-party science experts in biology and hydrology from the University of California, Davis. The goal is to get increased information on the sustainable and safe water use levels for the project. There remain open questions on the economic benefits to the town and other impacts. There are materials provided that address some of these concerns. We plan to meet with all stakeholders to discuss the economic reports that have just come out and gain a greater understanding of concerns and different points of view. We, we respect differences and try to address concerns through a variety of actions, but there are also times when we have not been as successful, and we are learning in those places and are open to work with stakeholders to do this in a better way that is open and transparent. We also have a responsibility to the environment. My company has supported and will continue to support comprehensive science-based laws and policies regulating water withdrawals. The goals must be long-term sustainability, fairness for all water users, openness to public input in order to provide a responsible framework for decision making. For example, in Maine, New Hampshire, and Michigan, we have supported recent legislation that meets these standards. Thank you for your time and attention. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Paul. I'd like to begin by asking uh, Mr. McFarland, and I'll, I may ask the same question of uh, Ms. Uh, Sleer. In McLeod, did Nestle hold any public hearings before you signed the contract with the municipality? And how many public meetings has uh, Nestle before the contract was signed with the municipality, and how many public meetings has Nestle held since the signing of the contract? There was one public meeting that um, the contract was discussed, um, and that was the same public meeting um, that the contract was approved. Um, so si that but si since the signing of the contract? Since the signing any? of the contract, I believe that Nestle has held two or three public meetings in the community and and they've been um they've been des they've been uh designed to um uh, they were they were public relations events what do you mean by that um they touted all of the benefits of the project and didn't really discuss any of the potential negative impacts well, what, what did the general community have an opportunity to participate in designing the plant none where it was located no um what about in michigan 
If you could uh, turn to. I turned it. Thank on. you. Okay. Um, Miss Swear. Yes. No. In Michigan, either. No to what? The no part no participation in designing the plant where it was located. No. And what about did Nestle hold any public meetings before you sign before the contract was signed with the municipality? We had. We are not a municipality. With the area. Pardon. With you with your community, was there any public were there any public meetings before the contract was signed? The contract was signed it, with a private um, property owner. And were there any public meetings before before that? I knew of two public meetings before, no, not before, not before, I'm sorry, not before we found out okay. about Nestle coming into Macosta. Okay. And since the signing of the contract, were there meetings? Uh, yes, there have been meetings. And what, and what was the nature of those meetings? The nature of the meeting were uh, Nestle would get up and, and speak to the, to the audience of what a good neighbor that they were, that it was going to be. And, and, and that there would be, there would be no adverse uh, resource impact. And did any, did you, were you there to present to respond or were there people from the community who responded or was it pretty much accepted that what Nestle said was true? No, there were people um, at the meetings, like myself, that were able to get up and ask questions. Uh, Mr. McCann, in your opinion, what will be the effects upon your community of the proposed uh, water bottling plant? Well, clearly the, the major impact is the, the unknown factor of what will be the impact on everyone else in the area. It, uh, you're talking 307,000 gallons of water a day. Uh, you're looking at wells that are considerably less deep than what has been proposed, so the impact on those wells is the unknown, and those were the questions that were asked at the public hearings that the state had. Do, do you think it's, it's possible for the bottling plant to exist without causing uh, the kind of consequences you're talking about? I don't believe so, no. I think that the, the, the situation is such that without uh, a thorough scientific review ahead of time, uh, but here you have a, a company that owned the land and just decided this is where we're going to do it. To your knowledge, has there been any thorough scientific review? There has been some scientific review done by both the company and by one of the towns involved, and they aren't in agreement. Uh, and the state becomes, I guess you'd say, the mediator, but, uh, and the final decision is the state's of whether or not to grant Does the permit. Does the company show an interest, Mr. McCann, in uh, being responsive to the community's concerns? No, unfortunately, the company took the attitude from day one that it was their land, they could do what they want. They, they, beginning back in 2000, they actually went in and disturbed some of the wetlands without a permit. This is the way it started, and this is what had the people concerned, and their attitude throughout the whole process has been, you people shouldn't be out here bothering us, you shouldn't be complaining. We're going to provide jobs, we're going to provide a tax, increase the tax base. So they had a very negative view of public input. Do, do you feel that existing laws and regulations are sufficient to prevent those consequences, even if the company is not willing to prevent them on their own? Well, as I said in my opening statement, I, I thought what we had done in 1998 to protect the environment seemed on the surface to look good, but in actual operation, no. I would say now that uh, the state and federal laws failed. Uh, in your written testimony, you criticized Governor Lynch for his role in the permitting process. What should he have done differently, in your opinion? Uh, I wouldn't say I was being necessarily critical. I just think that the, the, rea the reality is the governor could, could have probably come in sooner and maybe worked with EPA and the uh, Army Corps of Engineers instead of waiting until 2005. I think that what he tried to do was thwarted by what had been done by his predecessor who uh, made sure that DES was, quote, on, as he said in one of his speeches, more business friendly. I think that the governor had some difficulties that were not his fault, but he also had a situation where I think he could have acted sooner, but he didn't. You criticized the role of the Army Corps of Engineers. So what should they have done differently? As I understand the request from the governor to them, they were supposed to evaluate the information provided by the, uh, the, the applicant, USA Springs, the state, and the scientific data that I mentioned earlier about uh, that was provided by the town of Nottingham and uh, the uh, uh, consultant Nottingham had. 
in reviewing what they issued in August of 06, they basically took the information provided by the applicant and accepted it as a fact. I, I'm going to uh, return to the questioning in a moment. The uh, chair is going to recognize a distinguished member from California, uh, Congresswoman Diane Watson, for a round of questions. Uh, Congresswoman. I want to thank you, Mr. Chairman, for holding what I feel is a very important meeting and uh, very sensitive and relevant to our climatic conditions and what's happening today. The consumption of water is increasing at a rapid rate, and in the year 2002, Americans consumed 6,800 million gallons of bottled water, and I think I did most of that consumption myself. <laughs> <laughs> the United States, as well as the global population, is putting a strain on existing water supplies, and that's putting a strain on our existing supplies of groundwater and surface water. And the bottling industry is currently seeking to extract more water from rural areas to meet this growing demand. And I understand some of the water companies are taking uh, the water in their city and putting and bottling it and selling it uh, in stores. And so uh, there is a double profit there. But I'm very, very concerned in the way the process is being done. Not only our drinking water, but our purification of water. And uh, you might be aware that along the southern coast of California, we have a great deal of mercury in our water, and it has contaminated the sea life and particularly gotten into our fish life, particularly tuna. And we warn our citizens to not eat tuna off the uh, western coast of California. So uh, I understand that water that is extracted from ancient sources, and once that water has been depleted, it's gone forever. Uh, I missed the first part of the hearing, Mr. Chairman, but I don't know if the witnesses are from areas where there are ancient sources of water and as you were uh, speaking, I thought maybe you could tell us what we need to do to protect those sources. And particularly now, when we're in drought in California, and we have our water up in the northern part of our state, and we had talked one time about a peripheral canal where the water from the north in the deltas could come down to uh, southern California into our desert. But um, what can we do, and should we regulate the way groundwater is extracted and how much could be extracted? And should these fields be left alone for a while so groundwater could accumulate? That would take millions of years in California because we don't get much rain, truly. But uh, let me just start and go down the panel. What would you have us do? here in Washington to protect that groundwater from ancient sources. Let me start with Thank Mr. You. McFarland. Thank you very much. Um, uh, as I said in my opening testimony, one, that I missed. <laughs> yeah, one thing that <laughs> I think that, that is really critical, and, and you talk about ancient groundwater, yeah. and uh, one thing that, I, I'm from Mount Shasta in far northern California, and yeah, I requested that the that this committee, this subcommittee, uh, encourage United States Geological Survey scientific inquiry to monitor and characterize Mount Shasta's ground and surface water resources. This is especially important in the face of potential climate change impacts on California's water supply. So what it gets down to is good science. And I think that we don't really know whether the water that Nessie is proposing to bottle in McLeod is ancient water, or if it's water from last year, or if it's water from 10 years ago. And I, I think it really points to the need for, for really good United States Geological Survey studies of these aquifers before we start drawing them down. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Hoover? I agree with um, Mr. McFarland on, on his proposals also. Also, I think that there needs to be a protection of federal and state wetland laws from water extraction and diversion for export. 
and all water bottlers must meet standards to be set by the courts and the state law, including the no likely pollution impairment or destruction standard of Michigan's well-respected Michigan Environmental Protection Act, and amendment to the Federal Water Resource Development, Development Act to provide interest in, interested citizens with the right to enforce by citizen suits. Thank you. I would agree with what was been said earlier, and I think that the, the important thing is that the federal government's role should be to help bring, uh, through the geological uh, information that's been talked about, the facts to the situation when we have developments proposed like was in New Hampshire or what's happened in Michigan or California. I found from my own experience that we don't know uh, the, the science of the aquifers and, and a consultant for a company could come in and say, oh, there's tons of water on here. We don't need to worry about the impact. And there's no scientific backing for that. And I think the federal government's role would be to help provide that data so that both parties could sit down and look at what an aquifer, what the impact may really be. And so I would support what has been said by the two previous speakers. Should that be the responsibility of EPA? I would think, I would think EPA or a, the Department of Interior or both. I mean, the, the Department of Interior has some of the records because they've designated, like I mentioned in my testimony earlier, one of the rivers that could be impacted in the uh, New Hampshire plate case the Lamprey River is a, a wild and scenic river, it's so designated by the Department of Interior. So I would think that a combination of the Department of Interior uh, and the EPA would probably have the best data. Thank you. Ms. Paul. I first want to clarify that we don't use any ancient waters that are not replenishable. 100% of our water use is from replenishable sources. Um, as far as the federal role, I think we support the um, Linder's bill, which would say that we need a commission to look at water needs for the f next 50 years and what information can be provided, for example, from the USGS to inform the decisions at the state level. I uh, kind of like that idea, Mr. Chairman. Maybe we're looking at a different organization to uh, develop standards and uh, let states, we have Cal EPA in California, Water is our big issue. And uh, I think state by state, we ought to require them to have their own standards, their own organization that deals with water and plan for the next 100 years or so. Thank you so much, uh, panel. I appreciate your input. I, I thank you. Um. Thank the gentlelady for uh, questions. To uh, Ms. Paul, in your testimony, you represent yourself as a trustworthy steward of the environment, uh, absent a court order or other legal requirement. If local people in a community bring to your attention significant adverse environmental impacts from your pumping operations, such as low stream flows, would your company be willing to reduce or to stop pumping? We base all of our pumping decisions on the science that says um, what's a sustainable use. So if the science was showing it was not a sustainable use, yes, we would cut back. Okay. Uh, well, I if that is the case, and I take it as you say it, it's what you believe, uh, this subcommittee has been informed that your company continued to pump from its Stanwood plant in Michigan in the summer months this year, even when presented with photographic evidence that clearly show the flood, the flow levels in the stream-fed dead stream were dangerously low. We have a photo that was supplied to us by attorneys for MCWC that appears to show the dead stream living up to its name. Now, um, I would like you to look at the picture there, which, uh, which represents the, um, 
uh, low flow levels of the dead stream. We've also been informed that while Nestle's pumping may have been technically in compliance with a court order, this court order was only in place pending remand to a trial court after MCWC won its court case in order to determine, uh, determine safe pumping levels. Now, uh, have you, did Nestle see these photos? Have you ever seen these photos? I've never seen that photo. Um, have you seen any photos similar to that? Have you seen any photos of, de let of the dead stream? Let me say, that the question I think that's being raised here. Could you here speak directly into the mic? Sorry, the question that's being raised here is, I think those might be the mud flats. Are those the mud flats? Uh, well, I guess I can't. I won't these, get an this, so this represents this is a, what I know. a okay. picture taken of dead stream. And there are low flows low and high flows of water bodies naturally occurring and just because there's a low flow. That, so you, you're maintaining that this was a naturally occurring low flow. Is that your position? My position is that there's no harm to the environment, that there are naturally higher and lower flows, that this is affected by dams built by beavers, by many things, that um, the mud flats, when they show, are a feature that has resulted from a dredging, a historic dredging, and it's the natural sediment coming back to replace the dredged amount, uh, the dredged uh, soils. So, so again, uh, could so have been no Im no harmful impact from our use. I do ag agree with that statement. And and that is based on science. Is that is that yes. correct? Yes. Yes, it is. And uh, so it's either. Now, that position that you've offered, uh, is that the result of scientific studies that you've had done, or is it only your study, or is it a consensus of, of a number of scientific studies that have been done? And do you have those studies uh, to make them available to the committee? We do have studies, and, and we'd be happy to make them available. But is it one study that you've done, or are there other studies? Are there studies that are independent of your study? I know of no independent studies, but okay. I'm happy to share our studies. Uh, do you have any kind of knowledge of any scientific opinion that disagrees with your characterization? What I can say to that is there were, in the original lower court, some models created of what would be, could be the impact uh, of our use. That would be information that is different than what we've seen when we've actually used the water source. Now, uh, Ms. Paul, it's my understanding that the source of the groundwater in the cloud is partly from a glacier. How is Nestle going to address the restriction on water supply over the, hun over the next hundred years with climate change, uh, which potentially will change the amount of water flows from your source, given that your source is glacier fed? We have a permitted amount that we are planning um, to use. If there were any um, harm of that use, we would cut back. The amount of water, I, I feel compelled to give a little history here, but maybe I shouldn't. Uh, McLe McLeod came to us asking for um, our interest in coming to the area to um, build a bottling water plant. The reason being it was a town, a lumber town built um, that was in decline. And today in the school built for 250, there are eight students. It's my understanding that there's not someone um, afford, we're not able to afford an ambulance driver in the day. It's a community that's looking for opportunity for more jobs. They, they're looking for a light industry. They had a water use of the lumber mill prior um, that they wanted to um, allow that water to be put to good use and um, the contract to which you referred earlier, there were four meetings, uh, public meetings on that contract. Uh, has, has Nestle ever had any meetings with the uh, 
Garrison Place Real Estate Investment Trust uh, and or Francesco Rotundo, trustee, uh, doing business as USA Springs Incorporated. No, not to my knowledge. Uh, do you know if there's any uh, If there's any contact that any of those entities have had with Nestle? Not to my knowledge. Do you know if, uh, if Nestle uh, either offered or, uh, or received a request to uh, engage in a business transaction with any of those entities? Not to my knowledge. Relative, relative to the uh, Barrington Nottingham I don't believe we have any connection. Has, has, any has, Nestle do, has Nestle done any site characterization of that area at any time uh, or uh, engaged in any discussions with any principal or representative relative to uh, the siting of, of a uh, water bottling plant uh, or business transactions uh, subsequent to that in New Hampshire? Anywhere in New Hampshire? In, in, that, in that area at... Uh, at Nottingham and Baring at Barrington? Not to my knowledge. Any other place in New Hampshire? We look for spring sites in many states, um, and we have likely looked in New Hampshire. But you don't know, you've never heard of Mr. Francesco Rotondo? No, I have no contact with him. Or USA Springs Incorporated? I've heard of them, I don't know them. Has, has, um, has, ne has it been Nestle's practice over a period of time, given the large share that you have in the uh, bottled water market, to, uh, uh, to acquire uh, b bottling companies or bottling interest or, or, the, or to lease or to purchase any assets that relate to uh, water bottling and the acquisition of the water that the bottling uh, plants use? Yes, we sometimes do. Um, buy those rights or the business um, from others, yes. How, uh, how, how many, in, in how many instances have you done that? Is it rare or is that the way your business grows? Um, I would say it's ni neither rare nor how the business grows, but it's a way, it's one of many ways. If you would like me to find out the details of that, I'd be happy to offer it in written testimony. Yes, and I'd also like you to provide this uh, committee, since uh, you expressed that you didn't know, uh, any kinds of documents that you have uh, relating directly or indirectly to the Nottingham uh, Barrington uh, site that relates to the Garrison Place Real Estate Investment Trust, Francesco Rotondo, USA Springs, uh, any, any uh, uh, discussions uh, memoranda, emails, letters that uh, relate to uh, contact relative to that site or to the principals who are involved in that site. If you would do that, this committee would appreciate it. We'll do that. Thank you very much. Uh, I want to yeah, I, our, uh, uh, my time has expired. I've been uh, informed and uh, the gentlelady from California is recognized. I would uh, like to uh, give you my time, Mr. Chairman, so you can continue your line of questioning. I, I uh, want to thank the gentlelady. We'll Yield just to you. shut that off and take it to maintenance. Um, I want to go back to Mr. McCann. Uh, Mr. McCann, in your testimony, you allege specific failings in the enforcement of the, New Hampshire, of the New Hampshire and the federal laws with respect to the siting of a water bottling plant in your community. To what do you attribute these failings? Are the laws adequate or do they clearly prescribe the environment safeguards that must be followed? And if it's a question of inadequate enforcement, to what do you attribute this laxity? I think, as I said earlier, it's the law as written perhaps can uh, provide some public protection. The implementation needs to be improved. Uh, the federal role was, to put it mildly, I think very vague to people in the first year or two of this project. 
the environmental department of environmental services role was i think it was to be fair i think they were overwhelmed with the uh the fact that there th this company wanted to take this water out and didn't appear to have all the scientific data that des had looked for and that people like myself were asking for so i think that it was as I mentioned in my earlier testimony, this was the first test of our state law. Uh, I think it, the report card is still mixed. It's probably in the vicinity of C minus, and most of that might be as a result of uh, poor administration by the agencies involved, not necessarily poor writing of the law. But I don't deny that there's perhaps room for improvement in uh, correcting what we've seen in the first 10 years of that law. Uh, I had asked uh, uh, Ms. Paul, whose presence we're grateful for, a series of questions. Um, is there any question that I should have asked that I didn't ask relative to uh, the issues that relate to uh, the community that you're here on behalf of? As far as the connection with the... I'm just saying, are there any questions that I asked, that I did not ask, that you think should have been asked? I can't think of any, Mr. Okay. Chairman. I think you did a thorough job. Uh, Okay, let's go to uh, down the line here, starting with Mr. McFarland. Water bottlers often choose relatively remote and rural areas for bottling or pumping sites and will often seek access to water sources that are located in protected natural areas, areas that are protected either because of their intrinsic natural value or because of their relative ecological fragility. How do you think this committee should weigh the economic value of your industry uh, or, or, the, or the industry of the water uh, that is extracted and bottled versus the ecological value of protecting the delicate balance of these areas? Well, I think they should um, use good economic analysis and um, look at the true costs versus benefits of, um, of all of the resources in the area. And, you know, I think that the subcommittee understands that um, there, are, there is economic value to um, the water uh, for downstream uses, not uh, not only is it uh, of economic value to um, it, in terms of commerce, direct commerce. Um, so I think that I think that that um, the science of economics today looks at uh, the other value of those resources aside from just the pure um, you know dollar value of the resource put into a bottle. Thank you, thank Ms. you, Ms. Swear. Yes, um, I'm from Michigan, which you know, and we are living, I live in an economically depressed area, and I do feel that uh, we have to look at the economic um, picture, and when Nestle came into our area, that was one of the, um, the major draws that Nestle had said of coming into Macosta County. But we also, as residents of, of my area, this is our livelihood. I am surrounded by lakes. I happen to live on a lake myself. And this is one of the water is our heritage. And I feel that it needs to take into effect what what the effect is going to be in the area. And with more scientific um, data available, um, MCWC has hired a hydrologist and he is continually looking at what, this, what the harm is to our, um, to our area, to our natural resources, which a good one you know, was the one that you had there. And I lived just five miles from the dead stream. What, what, what could that have been, that low water level, could that have been caused by beavers? There have been beavers there on and off for years. The, um, the people who live on the dead stream have no, never... Is that, a, is that a yes or a no? I mean, could that have been caused by beavers? Yes. Yes, it can, be, it can be caused by beavers. And in this case, do you think that it was caused by beavers? I can't answer that. I'm, okay. I do not know. Okay. Thank you. Mr. McCann. 
Uh, do, do you want to uh, comment as to uh, the fact that these water bottlers are ch choosing relatively remote and rural areas for bottling or pumping sites who often seek access to water sources that are located in protected natural areas? And how do you think this committee should weigh the economic value of, you know, the, of the industry versus uh, the ecological value of protecting the delicate balance in these areas and also the uh, access to water for uh, uh, civilian populations? Well, I think that clearly the, in the past, uh, in, in the instance, especially in Barrington and Nottingham, but I've read about you know, other po companies, obviously the economic value of, this of a proposed development is part of the process to quote unquote sell it to the community. And if a community has had hard economic times, it's clearly one mechanism they can use to try to come in. Uh, I think the federal legislation and the ideas that have been put forward by Mr. McFarland make sense. I think we need to have a level playing field, which means we try to, uh, as I said earlier, balance the scientific data, but we also work uh, to try to have equal opportunity for development, but also at the same time recognizing, as you said, that we have a very delicate balance, and if there's a reason for uh, the government to become more involved, I think it is to protect the environment and, and to ensure that uh, a, a well-regulated uh, industry is working, but it shouldn't be at the deprivation of the environment or the people who live in the community. Uh, out of fairness, Ms. Paul, do you want to respond? Yes, thank you. Everything is made with water, everything. In fact, in our bottle, the biggest user of water is the plastic bottle, which is the lightest weight plastic bottle on the market, as I mentioned. It's less than a half an ounce. So think of anything made of plastic that's greater than a half an ounce. It's made with more water. We are a very visible user of water, but we are not a very large user of water on the global scale or on the US scale or on a region scale. On a particular site, we do two things. We pick sites where our use can be sustainable, and then we monitor that use. What we about are the, What about the environmental effects? Do you, do you consider those at all times, the ecological effects of what you do? Yes, we do. Okay, I, I want to thank I you. think we're a model water user. Thank you very much. I, I, I want to thank the uh, members of the panel for responding. I'm going to uh, recognize uh, Mr. Issa. Um, and I, I want to say that our clock, uh, for some reason, always stays uh, on, on green, uh, which is... Uh, which is looking better all the time right now. <laughs> <laughs> which is good. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, a lot of the questions that needed to be asked, you asked, and, and so I'll try to do follow-ups mostly. Uh, uh, Ms. Paul, do you produce, does Nestle produce beer? No. Do you produce soft drinks? No. Uh, <coughs> well, would it de define soft drinks. We do Pepsi, have Pepsi, no, Coca-Cola like type that. products. Okay. Now, are these figures, in your estimation, accurate? That bottled water consumes about 1.3 gallons uh, per gallon of water delivered. Well, soft drinks consume about 1.7 gallons per gallon delivered, and beer uh, consumes about 2.1 gallons for every gallon delivered. Do those figures ring a bell to you from your history? My history would say that our company uses 1.3, that carbonated soft drinks for just processing uses three, not counting the water to process their ingredients or the water to grow the ingredients. And beer is more like nine gallons, not counting the growing and the past um, processing of right the because they have to boil the hops and all it the other it's processes. distillation it's well, I apologize for the low figures I chose the lowest of all of them I could get just because I love Anheuser-Busch and I'm, I'm a beer <laughs> drinker from time <laughs> to time so I didn't I didn't want to do anything adverse but L let the record stipulate yeah <laughs> <laughs> uh, but as a Californian I love my wine too <laughs> let's not get that but I'm a Californian let, let me understand this if you are a typical crop producer, for every gallon of water you pump out, for every, let me rephrase that, for every 10 gallons you pump out, eight gallons are going to evaporate. Basically, nothing is going to deplete 
the groundwater table as much as for example our rice production in northern california by definition we're spraying water out and asking it to please evaporate in one hundred degree sacramento day is there anyone mr mcfarland you know you've seen that 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 is that is essentially what how we grow rice is you spread water over and ask it to please evaporate absolutely so although today we are talking about the bottled water industry and clearly you concentrate your taking from one area wherever your plant is we have in california and around the country but particularly california where we don't have the great lakes uh, which my understanding the great lakes are basically a river with some big puddles in them that every bit of water if we took every bit of water out of the great lakes today in a matter of two years they would they would essentially refill I know there's a gentleman shaking his head no, but I'm a Clevelander. I remember when the Great Lakes were dead, and it took less than a decade for them to come back to life because they flow completely through every couple of years. We don't have that in California. So, Mr. McFarland, excluding the fact that I, I clearly understand how you're personally affected and your water table's affected, don't we have a national problem of ground water, ground table aquifer management? W wouldn't you say that, that, this, that you're picking out this particular point because it's in your backyard, but, but you would agree that we have throughout California and the nation a question of how are we managing groundwater? Yes. And I think, although you're not in agriculture, you shook your head yes, like most of us as Californians. We understand that agriculture clearly needed is the biggest consumer because of the fact that we spill it on the ground of water that doesn't get back into the water table. Absolutely, and I believe that if um, Nessie was paying uh, as much in McLeod as the rice farmers pay for their water in Calusa, that there would be less opposition to it in McLeod. Well, uh, and I'm a businessman, so I understand a problem is something money can't solve. It does sound like money could solve this one. Uh, well, it could solve part of the problem. I mean, part of the big problem here is that this is an outrageously egregious contract. It's very unfair to the community of McLeod. The price. The price. The price yeah, the, the price. They, they, they're stealing it. Uh, as a Southern California, remember I opened up with <laughs> all Northern California think Southern California steals. But I get your point that that is a question <laughs> of how much money uh, is being spent for the resources being taken from your region. Uh, I'm, look, I'm a federalist. I believe the federal government only has the right to do what it implicitly has the right to do. Other than ensuring that federal access to navigable waterways, the national fisheries, uh, and the Clean Water Act, other than those, do any of you know a legitimate existing federal hook that we can take? I mean, and, and those three are, are big. We do have a right to make sure that Nestle or anyone else is not taking water in a way that pollutes somebody else's water. We have to make sure that the 0.3 gallons that don't go into the bottle don't end up being back flushed in some way. And we all know some of the history of that. But are there any other hooks that we should really be aware of that exist today beyond, because we're, we primarily make sure that agencies are doing their job. That's one of the biggest things we do on this committee. So. Are those three the big three that we should be looking at as we're going through this problem, not just of a particular bottling operation or two, but groundwater and safe drinking water? Boy, that's a question that's out of my league. But those three ring a bell and you're comfortable yeah, with Yeah, I mean, the navigable waterways thing, uh, that, that comes up as, a, as definitely uh, potentially applicable here. And, and we and would certainly make sure the Corps of Engineers ensured that not so much water was taken from any source as to adversely affect navigable waterways. Uh, is there any, any, any of the rest of you have anything I've missed? Because when this hearing's over and, this, and any subsequent hearings, that's what we have to look at is can we make agencies do their jobs better? And it's something the chairman and I try to do whenever possible is make the agencies do their jobs without legislation. Uh, Ms. Paul. You know, you're obviously the, uh, <coughs> the subject of a lot of this because of your company's operations. You mentioned your stewardship of, uh, of the environment and, and how you make sure, or you said, that what you take is sustainable. In the case of the Mount Shasta operation, could you go through the sustainability, in your company's opinion, the environmental impact, and how you reach the decision for how much you can 
individually and with the other companies already operating there collectively take out of the aquifer or the groundwater? Yes. We are still in the middle of that regulatory process. Um, the we signed a contract which um, we actually pay more for the water than any other user. And it is reliant on meeting the terms of CEQA. CEQA is an envi involves an environmental impact statement. We um, have done the science to look at um, what our impact would be. And in this case, we, we, it's a unique situation in, in the sense that we could take the amount of water that we would use at peak out of the system to see the impact. You can't usually do that. You usually have to model it. But because of the way the springs come together, and then we, um, we could divert one of the springs and, and just have the amount that would be left You can to test your theory, in other we words. We could test the theory. Um, that said, we've heard from the town and from environmental groups that they want more information. And we're in a process, we're sitting down with um, environmental groups, uh, concerned citizens, and um, a third party, hydrologists and um, biologists from UC Davis at the recommendation of the environmental groups. And we're going through what more science would they be comfortable with that we would be comfortable with to get more information. Excellent. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I think this takes us a long way with this panel. I appreciate your uh, calling this hearing. I, I thank the uh, gentleman from California for his participation. As always, I know that uh, you've had a markup and you're trying to do double duty here, and I appreciate you being here. Uh, the general lady from California has informed me that she doesn't have any other questions of this panel, nor do I. I want to thank each member of the panel for um, your participation. Uh, this committee will continue to look at the issues that have arisen as a result of your testimony, and uh, we uh, may and we reserve the right to submit additional questions in, in, in writing. And I uh, appreciate Ms. Paul's uh, presence here, and uh, we would ask that you would respond you know, to the committee's inquiries uh, as, as you indicated you would. And so um, I'm going to dismiss the first panel, and we're going to call the second panel to come up. Thank you again. And uh, with the second panel, please come forward. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. makers and the public about food safety, agriculture, environmental issues, and water rights. From 1997 to 2005, Ms. Howder served as Director of Public Citizens Energy and Environmental Program, which focused on water, food, and energy policy. Before that, she was Environmental Policy Director for Citizen Action and worked on sustainable energy campaigns for the Union of Concerned Scientists. Uh, next, uh, Mr. David Hindman, is that the correct? Uh, Mr. Heinemann is Professor of Geological Sciences at Michigan State University, where he studies the physical and chemical processes that influence groundwater flow. 
Professor Heinemann's research also examines how land use changes in regional watersheds affect ecological health. For the past 10 years, Professor Heinemann has been associate editor of the journal Groundwater, was association editor of the journal Water Resources Research for five years, and has published widely on hydrological issues. Professor Noah Hall is professor at Wayne State University Law School in Detroit, Michigan, where he teaches environmental law and water law. Before joining the, water, the uh, Wayne State faculty, Professor Hall taught at the University of Michigan Law School and was an attorney with the National Wildlife Federation, where he managed the Great Lakes Water Resources Program. Professor Hall also worked in private practice in Minnesota for several years and clerked for the Honorable Kathleen A. Blatt's Chief Justice of the Minnesota Supreme Court. Mr. Joseph Doss is President and CEO of the International Bottled Water Association in Alexandria, Virginia. The IBWA was founded in 1958 and is the trade association representing the bottled water industry both internationally and domestically. Mr. Doss has extensive experience in association management, food and drug matters, governmental affairs, public relations, and legal issues. Before joining the IBWA, Mr. Doss was the Director of Public Affairs at the Consumer Healthcare Products Association from 1997 to 1999. Mr. James Wilfong is an entrepreneur, educator, and public servant. He's Executive Director of H2O for Maine, a groundwater advocacy group. He also served as a member of the Maine Legislature and as an Assistant Administrator for the Office of International Trade at the Small Business Association during the Clinton Administration. Mr. Wilfong is co-founder of several enterprises, including Atomic Ski USA and Innovative Applied Sciences, a software development company of which he is the chairman. I want to thank the members of the panel for being here. It is the policy of the Committee on Oversight and Government Reform to swear in all the witnesses before they testify. I would ask each of you to rise. <coughs> all of you to rise and raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. I do. Thank you very much. Let the record reflect that the witnesses have answered in the affirmative. As with the first panel, I ask that the witnesses give an oral summary of his or her testimony and to keep this summary under five minutes in duration. Bear in mind the complete written statement will be included in the hearing record. I would like to begin with uh, Ms. Howder. Thank you. You may proceed. Good afternoon, Chairman Kucinich and Congresswoman Watson. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. My organization, Food and Water Watch, is very concerned about the commodification of water which is a resource owned by no one and needed by everyone. In setting the context for the discussion of the bottled water industries, mining, and rural communities, it's important to acknowledge both the industry's explosive growth over the last 20 years and its profitability, that its profitability is based on selling the myth that bottled water is somehow safer and better than tap water. The truth is that bottled water is generally no cleaner, no safer, or healthier than tap water, and that the federal government requires far more rigorous and frequent testing and, and monitoring of municipal drinking water. Almost half of all bottled water is nothing more than reprocessed tap water. The FDA only requires that companies test four empty bottles once every three months for bacterial contamination, and they must test a sample of water after filtration and before bottling for bacteria once a week. In contrast, the EPA requires that public water systems serving more than one million residents test water 300 times per month, and utilities serving more than three million people must collect and test 480 samples monthly. Now, I raise this issue because the lax regulation of the bottled water industry is one of the things that helps make it profitable, uh, along with the little that they pay to access water. A former chairman of Perrier was quoted as saying, quote, it struck me that all you had to do is take the water out of the ground and then sell it for more than the price of wine, milk, or for that matter, oil, end of quote. And it's true, bottled water costs more than gasoline, or um, the companies charge about $1.50 for a 20-ounce bottle of water, which pencils out to more than $9 a gallon. That profit must be measured against the mere cents that it costs them to bottle the water. 
But those few cents are only the company's internal costs, the ones that they have to pay. The mining of water does not include the external economic, social, and environmental costs to rural communities and society in general, such as the loss of groundwater, toxic emissions from plastic production and disposal, air pollution, and damage to roads and other local infrastructure from transporting the products. For instance, plastic bottle production in the U.S. annually requires more than 1.5 million barrels of oil, enough to fuel 100,000 cars. Worldwide bottling of water uses about 2.7 million tons of plastic. And after the production of million, billions of plastic bottles and the national and international travel of bottled water, billions of those empty bottles remain. 86% of empty plastic water bottles in the U.S. land in the garbage instead of being recycled. Besides the cost of, to the environment of the plastic bottles, water mining could have long-lasting effects on the rural communities where it's mined. When the flows and levels of a region's springs, wetlands, lakes, streams, and rivers are materially altered because of the extraction for bottling, the entire local and even regional environment suffers, and this extends to the activities that depend on water, agriculture, the individuals in the community, businesses, tourism, and recreation. And groundwater is a fragile resource. Our nation's groundwater reserve is not a single vast pool of underground water, but is contained within a variety of aquifer systems that cross political lines at county, state, and international boundaries. Groundwater management decisions in the U.S. are made at local level by a state, municipality, or special district formed for groundwater management. The monitoring of groundwater reserves is uneven around the country, and often the amount of water available in an aquifer is unknown because of lack of data collection and, anal and the analysis that is needed to support informed decision making about groundwater. Some communities across the country developed water management plans that take into account such issues as population and climate change, including drought. The people and businesses living and operating there have to live within the rules set forth in these plans, but often bottling companies get a nearly free pass, even though they're permanently removing water from a community's aquifer. Indeed, in McLeod, California, uh, which we discussed earlier, they plan to extract about 500 million gallons of water annually, and it appears that the contract would give the company preference over the town's ratepayers. What is more, the local water district bears all the responsibility for the well-being of the springs and the water infrastructure. The ongoing extraction of water from cities and rural areas to be bottled and sold. I'm going to ask the gentlelady uh, uh, to um, wrap it up okay. because your, your time has expired and I just want to uh, try to keep to the five-minute limit. Okay. Thank you. Um, so our recommendation is that the federal government should, of course, strengthen bottled water quality regulations, but just as importantly, we believe that there must be some kind of regulation or standard at state and local levels that addresses how much water bottling companies can extract from state. And federal funding should be provided to collect adequate data um, about the health and quantity of groundwater, and this data needs to be properly analyzed. Th uh, thank you. I, I, um, I want to thank you for your excellent testimony. And I just want every member of the uh, panel to know that uh, your statement, the entire statement, will be included in the record of the hearing. So, um, you know, I know having been on the other side of a, um, of the, um, of a panel and being testifying that the tendency is to try to get in every word. That's where I learned how to talk fast. But I, you can just present a good solid five minutes and we'll include everything in the record. And I think during the Q&A, we'll probably have an opportunity to cover it all. So with that, uh, again, I want to thank uh, Ms. Howder for her testimony and proceed to Professor Heinemann.
Thank you, Chairman Kucinich and members of the subcommittee for inviting me to testify today. Could you uh, move a little bit closer to the mic? Certainly. So in addition to my research in groundwater hydrology and surface water hydrology, which you mentioned, I've also been an expert witness in several cases involving groundwater, and those have included several that relate to the bottled water industry. And in all cases so far, I have been retained by those opposed to the bottled water industry. However, today I've been asked to come here on my own behalf and give general scientific opinions about the impact of the bottled water industry on surface water, groundwater, and riparian areas. And in addition to that testimony, I'll briefly discuss some issues related to the Food and Drug Administration's definition of spring water, which I think relates to many of the issues where bottled water companies are placing their, their plants in the headwater of stream systems. The issues that I see with the FDA definition is there's little to distinguish spring water from diffuse groundwater seepage into stream systems. In addition, uh, if we look at what's happening in groundwater systems, an area that could be called a spring is really a focused area where water is coming out of the subsurface, whereas most groundwater is flowing in in a diffuse sense along these surface water systems. And that's where I think some of the co confusion comes to play. The FDA has a specific definition that says if the groundwater is not extracted directly from the orifice of the spring, then it can be tapped by a borehole that is in connection with the same formation, and that connection has to be shown in a hydrogeologically scientific fashion. The issue with that specific clause leads bottled water plants to often be put in headwaters of streams because in those areas it's much more, it's really easy to demonstrate that connection because there's very little s flow coming into the system other than what is coming in via some localized areas. The problem with that is that these headwater systems are also environmentally sensitive, and they're areas where the consequences and impacts of pumping may be the largest. If you look at, if you separate these out into really groundwater and surface water issues, and, and you look at what the previous panelists have already mentioned, most of the impacts that you heard were related to surface water, and that's because that's where a lot of the environmental concern is. You also heard a little bit about groundwater concerns. If there are people that are living in the vicinity of high capacity wells, the water table or the level of water in the subsurface is declined in the vicinity of that well, and that can extend over a large area. So there are potential impacts to localized groundwater users. I'll focus most of my testimony, however, on the surface water issues because that's where, again, the most environmental harm is. The, if you pump shallow groundwater, effectively there's a one-to-one -one relationship between how much is pumped and the reduction in stream flow in the nearby areas. So high capacity wells can, as a result of that, cause large percentage declines in the flow of surface water. When you reduce surface water flow, by the nature of doing that, you're also reducing the level of streams. If you reduce the level of streams, there's environmental consequences, especially if there are riparian wetlands right in the vicinity of that. Some of the concerns that have been expressed in cases I've been involved in are reduced navigability, degraded aesthetic quality, and impairment of the stream for aquatic organisms and fish. In addition, the pumping can alter the water temperature, which can also be a problem for the ecological systems. Finally, some of the most sensitive systems are wetland and lake systems, where if you lower the groundwater level below these, if they're connected with groundwater, the level of the wetlands will also decline. The seasonal effects are worse. If you look at pumping during the middle of the growing season, the declines will be more significant. They're even more significant if you're in a drought period. So all of these things are on top of the natural variability in a system. In terms of 
recommendations. I would recommend additional funding in areas of hydrologic science. Several people have mentioned this already in terms of examining new mapping approaches and new approaches to characterize what the impact of not only bottled water pumping, but any broad level of pumping and climate change and land use change. Thank you for the opportunity to speak to you today. I, I thank the gentleman, Professor Hall. Thank you, Chairman and members of the committee. Um, I'm going to very briefly summarize the applicable state and federal law uh, that deals with the extraction and pumping of groundwater, uh, both for bottled water and for other water uses. Uh, water use and extraction, uh, both groundwater and, and surface waters, is primarily the domain of state law. Um, the, the rules governing how much water you can pump, what, from what resources, how much impacts are allowed, are typically addressed under state law. Um, state law comes at groundwater pumping from two directions. There's a background common law principles that are intended to primarily address conflicts between water users of, the share, of a shared water resource. Um, the original rule that was used here was what was called a rule of capture. And what this meant was basically, uh, if you could pump the water, it's yours. It'd be no different from me turning to Mr. Doss on my, my left here grabbing his water, drinking it, saying I got it, now it's mine. Um, it th so it was, in effect, the rule of capture is really no rule at all. Uh, uh, that rule has uh, not remained in almost any state, the one exception being Texas, which I'll come back to in a moment. Um, but in almost every other state, the rule of capture, uh, we've moved beyond that, and we've evolved towards a more correlative rights approach to share groundwater resources. And what this means is that an, a landowner has the right to the reasonable use of the groundwater below his property unless that reasonable use interferes with a neighboring landowner's reasonable use of the same groundwater. And when reasonable uses of shared waters uh, are in conflict or interfere with each other, courts reconcile those conflicts using a variety of equitable principles uh, including opportunities for water conservation, sharing, reduction of need, reasonableness of use, economic value, social harms, environmental impacts, et cetera. Uh, most recently, we've seen this shared correlative rights approach to, to groundwater use uh, extend to the types of conflicts that Professor Heinemann just mentioned, where groundwater withdrawals impact surface waters. And courts have begun applying the same principles, shared reasonable use, correlative rights, um, equitable remedies to resolve groundwater to surface water conflicts. The common law, however, is not perfect. It has some serious shortcomings. Uh, primary among those, I believe, are first of all the cost of litigation, which several mem members of the first panel can attest to firsthand. Common law litigation tends to be very expensive and requires the use of numerous expert testimony. Uh, secondly, the common law does a very good job of protecting shared rights in groundwater, but it doesn't do such a great job of uh, ensuring environmental protection uh, of public resources from water pumping. And this is where state statutes have come in. Uh, many, uh, I'd say most, but not all states have in place some type of regulatory statu statute scheme to ensure that water withdrawals don't have unreasonable harm on natural resources, aquatic life, fisheries, wetlands, et cetera. Uh, some of these systems and programs work quite well. Some of them don't. There's tremendous diversity, both in uh, how strict the standards are, how well they're enforced, and in the ability for citizens to avail themselves of remedies under the statutes. Uh, beyond state law, I, I want to briefly mention the federal role in all of this. The federal government doesn't regulate water use, uh, and for the federal government to take on regulation of water use would be an undertaking that would make regulation of carbon emissions seem modest in comparison. Uh, but the federal government has been a driver of water use. The, F the Food and Drug Administration, the FDA, for over a decade, through its source identity regulations, have required that if water bottlers want to label their bottled water as spring water, 
and spring water seems to be the label that consumers prefer over any other, then as, doc as Dr. Heinemann said, uh, it requires the water bottlers to go to uh, groundwater that has an immediate and direct connection to a natural spring. And inadvertently, this puts tremendous pressure on the water resources that are least able to withstand groundwater pumping pressures. Uh, bottled water is not a large user of groundwater nationwide or on a macro scale. Uh, but when bo water bottlers, uh, to comply with the FDA regulations, go into the headwaters of a relatively small spring system, even a modest size withdrawal, a few hundred thousand gallons per day, which is modest in this uh, area, can have a significant environmental impact. So I'd offer two brief recommendations for the committee's consideration. The first is I would echo the recommendations of several of the panelists before me that we give the USGS, the US Geological Survey, increased support uh, and resources to conduct extensive groundwater mapping, water use data analysis, uh, investigative studies. The USGS data is critically important to both state and private decision makers in this area. Secondly, I would encourage this committee to exercise its oversight jurisdiction and powers to work collaboratively with the FDA uh, and other stakeholders involved in this issue to reform and revise the FDA's bottled water identity rules uh, to basically allow water bottlers to continue to identify their product in a way that consumers demand and deserve, but doesn't put pressure on our most vulnerable springs. I, I thank, thank the gentleman uh, for his uh, testimony, and I will note that uh, you presented this committee with an extensive um, preparation, and I think the members are grateful to you and to all those who have presented this uh, voluminous testimony. So, Mr. Doss, please continue. Good afternoon, uh, Chairman Kucinich and Congresswoman Watson. I think this just left. Uh, my name is Joe Doss, and I am President and CEO of the International Bottled Water Association. We appreciate this opportunity to discuss environmental issues associated with the bottled water industry's extraction of groundwater. Groundwater, particularly spring water, is the primary water source for bottled water products sold in the United States. Because a long-term sustainable supply of high-quality water is the foundation and lifeblood of bottled water companies, IBWA members recognize the critical importance of environmental conservation and stewardship of all water resources. In particular, IBWA supports groundwater management laws that are comprehensive, science-based, multi-jurisdictional, treat all users equitably, and balance the rights of current users and the future needs to protect the sustainable resource. The bottled water industry uses only minimal amounts of groundwater to produce this important consumer product and does so with great efficiency. According to a 2005 study by the Drinking Water Research Foundation, annual bottled water production accounts for less than two one-hundredths of one percent of the total groundwater withdrawn in the United States each year. The two largest users we've heard before of groundwater in the United States are irrigation and public water systems. According to the 2004 United States Geological Survey, irrigation accounted for 68 percent of the total groundwater withdrawn, while public water systems was the second largest user at 20 percent. It is important to note that an aquifer or other groundwater source does not know the difference between water withdrawn to produce bottled water and water withdrawn to make other beverages or consumer products. Although bottled water is currently the second most consumed beverage in the United States, its consumption volume is about half of that of carbonated soft drinks and only slightly ahead of milk and beer. All such beverage products fundamentally have a high water content. Bottled water is just one of countless products and enterprises that use water and to single out any one product or industry, particularly one that accounts for only 0.02 percent of all withdrawals will not be effective in sustaining groundwater resources. The states have a strong interest in regulating and ensuring efficient use of water resources and must effectively manage them to ensure that this important resource will be sustainable for all users. IBWA believes that in order to ensure sustainable water resources, a comprehensive management approach must be taken. To this end, the bottled water industry has been a strong and vocal supporter of comprehensive state groundwater management legislation that requires the permitting of large groundwater withdrawals and ensures science-based approach to evaluating potential impacts of all users. 
For example, we recently supported the enactment of such laws in Maine, Michigan, and New Hampshire. Based on our, our experiences in the states, it is very clear to IBWA that there is a need for more and better data on the aquifers throughout the United States in order to assist state authorities in managing available water resources. We think that this is an area where the federal government can play an important role. As a result, IBWA supports the enactment of H.R. 135, which would establish the 21st Century Water Commission to make recommendations on how to ensure comprehensive water resource strategy in the United States. The Commission would be authorized to, one, project U.S. future water supply and demand, two, study current water management programs of federal, interstate, state, and local agencies, and three, consult with representatives of such agencies to develop recommendations for a comprehensive water strategy. Bottled water is comprehensively regulated as a processed food product by the FDA. By law, FDA's bottled water regulations must be as stringent and protective of the public health as EPA standards for public drinking water systems. Under FDA regulations, there are two fundamentally distinct types of bottled water products. The first type is natural water, such as artesian water, mineral water, and spring water, which all have groundwater sources. The second type is processed water, such as purified water, which could be from a groundwater or a municipal water source. Bottled water is sold in small containers at retail locations and restaurants and is also delivered to homes and offices in three and five gallon bottles used with water coolers. In summary, Mr. Chairman, bottled water is a safe, healthy, convenient food product and is an extremely small user of groundwater when compared with all other users. The bottled water industry is a conscientious and dedicated steward of the environment which has been demonstrated by its active pursuit of responsible groundwater management policies at both the federal and state level. IBWA supports groundwater management policies, laws, and regulations that are comprehensive, science-based, multi-jurisdictional, treat all users equitably, and balances the rights of current users and the future needs to provide a sustainable resource. Thank you for considering our thoughts, and IBWA stands ready to assist the committee and the subcommittee as it considers this very important issue. I thank the gentleman. Mr. Wilfong. Um, thank you, uh, Chairman Kucinich. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me to testify here today on this very important topic. I'm from a little town in, western, uh, in the western mountains Maine, of Maine called Stowe. Stowe is located in a very freshwater-rich back, uh, area backed up against the state of New Hampshire in the White Mountain National Forest. In 2003, several citizens of this region, including myself, were concerned about the large-scale extraction that was taking place in, in the Freiburg, Maine section of the Saco River Sand and Gravel Aquifer, an aquifer that extends from Bartlett, New Hampshire to Hiram, Maine. The recipient of this extracted water is the largest bottled water company in the world, Nestle. We knew that they were not here for a little water, that they he were here for a lot of water. Uh, this raised several immediate questions and concerns for us. One, who owns the water? Two, who will control the usage of the water? Three, how will the water be allocated if it becomes limited? Four, is damage being done to the aquifer or the surrounding environment? Five, do the citizens of Maine have a financial interest in this resource? Six, which regulatory agency is responsible to sort out these many questions? Is it a state, local, or federal responsibility? And seven, since water is considered a tradable good or a commodity, is trade treaty law somehow involved? And how would that law affect local, state, and federal laws in the environmental area? And finally, eight, is our com community ready for this business? I am sure that we had a few more thoughts, but this was a start. The answers to these questions in Maine were not encouraging. We are ruled by the common law of absolute dominion. Essentially, this law means if the wa water runs under your property, you can pump it. In Texas, they call it the law of the biggest pump. Under this doctrine, the landowners over groundwater claim ownership. This may seem strange as groundwater and surface water are part of one hydrological system and in Maine, surface water is in the public trust and groundwater is not. So several questions remain to be answered. So who will allocate the usage? It is not clear, it still has not been decided. Is the environment and the aquifer being damaged? Well, in some cases, studies have been done, but in many cases, 
uh, expertise for review and long-term evaluation has not been sufficient, and the public isn't sure the resource is being protected. What can citizens do to protect their interests? In Maine, we wanted to pass a comprehensive law. We looked at four legislative concepts. We wanted to extend Maine's environmental law to large-scale extraction. We wanted a fair, open, and transparent citizen's process. We wanted to establish reasonable use standards. We wanted to place groundwater under the public trust doctrine, and we wanted some recognition of the public investment in clean water. We suggested a severance tax on major extraction and, and to have the revenues invested in a permanent fund similar to uh, Alaska's uh, oil trust. H2O for me, the bottlers and their stakeholders, launched into a statewide debate and added to the national debate on groundwater issues. After nearly four years of debate and discussion, H2O decided it was necessary to protect the resource and the environment as a first step. We found legislators who agreed. We also found a willingness among the bottlers and other stakeholders to be, constructed, be constructive, and we negotiated a position. In June 2007, the Maine legislature passed a law that does the following. It places all large volume wells under the Natural, Res Protect Natural Resource Protection Act. Two, it provides for an open and transparent pro citizens process. Three, it requires perpetual monitoring of all high volume wells. Uh, four, it requires the applicant to pay for expert consultants to review, evaluate, and make recommendations to the state. Five, it establishes a freshwater resource committee within the state planning office to investigate all freshwater uses within watersheds. And six, it places environmental management and, and review responsibility for groundwater into two departments. That is essentially what it does. It does not establish a public trust for water. It does erode absolute dominion. The law will only be effective if citizens are diligent about the enforcement of its intent. Finally, what could the Congress do to help the situation? Well, it could provide financial resources and technical assistance to local and state regulators involving environmental studies and review. Two, it could establish federal minimum environmental standards for major extraction wells. Three, it could review trade rules concerning water being designated as a tradable good and ensure access and control of clean, fresh water for the long-term best interests of, the, of U.S. citizens. Four, it could extend standing to U.S. citizens using the Clean uh, Water Act as a model. S five, it could place all fresh water in the public trust and it could hold a national conference on freshwater issues. The main law is a start. Each state must review its situation and adjust its state statutes to meet the new realities of the freshwater demands of the bottled water industry. For those states with weak and outdated law, the new Maine law could be a first step model. I wish that more than 30 years ago, when I was a young legislator who was working on clean water law, that I could have seen the future. We could have fixed our groundwater law right then. Water was bestowed upon us by the same power that granted us our freedom. Water is life. When it comes to potable water law, we can't afford to get it wrong. Thank you very much. I thank the gentleman. Uh, we're now going to go to questions of the panel uh, and to Professor Hall. In many of the bottling cases, federal jurisdiction is invoked when groundwater extraction affects surface waters. Do you believe that federal agencies, such as the Army Corps and the EPA, diligently enforce acts like the Clean Water Act and the Endangered Species Act in these cases. Uh, th thank you, Chairman. Um, in the bottled water cases, that in, in many of the bottled water cases, including some of the ones I've been involved in, and I, I should disclose that uh, I represented some conservation groups, Trout Unlimited, National Wildlife Federation, in the Nestle case in Michigan, uh, federal jurisdiction and federal statutes were not an issue. Um, federal statutes really com come into play only incidentally. If, for example, the bottled water discharger is also, uh, the, bo the water bottler is also discharging pollutants into a navigable waterway um, or filling a wetland. But keep in mind that the federal wetland regulations only pertain to the placement of dredged or fill material into a wetland, not the draining of water out of a wetland. Right. So the, the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers doesn't really have much of a hook 
to address uh, the environmental impacts of water withdrawals. Okay, thank you. Now, in the proposed Great Lakes Compact that's not been ratified by Congress, I understand there's an exception to the anti-diversion provisions for products that are less than 5.7 gallons. Does this provision effectively exempt typical bottled water products, and if it does, is there environmental justification for the 5.7 gallon threshold requirement? Uh, that's an excellent question, Chairman. Thank you. Um, uh, of course, I've been intimately involved in, in both the negotiation and drafting of uh, the proposed Great Lakes Compact. Uh, the exception that you mentioned, it, the, the Great Lakes Compact bans diversions of water out of the Great Lakes Basin, which includes parts of eight U.S. states plus two Canadian provinces. Uh, exempted from that ban on diversions of water out of the basin uh, are water, is water in containers less than 5.7 gallons, basically an office cooler. Uh, so you're correct, bottled water is exempted from the ban on diversions. However, the, the Great Lakes Compact would also require uh, public management by the states of water withdrawals, both ground and surface water, uh, at the state level for water that's used within the basin. And bottled wa uh, water withdrawals for bottled water or any other use are still subject to those requirements. Uh, so I think it's actually a pretty fair compromise, all things considered. A water bottler within the Great Lakes Basin, if the Great Lakes Compact is enacted, which I hope it is, uh, would be subject to a long list of permit requirements, environmental protection standards, water conservation measures, uh, as well as citizen review uh, and judicial review of any permits that are granted. They wouldn't be flat out banned, but they would be under uh, pretty good regulations and I think it would be uh, a step in a good direction. It's my understanding that the FDA did not subject its spring water classification to a NEPA review. Do you think it was obligated to do so under law? And if it did undertake such a review now, what would be the practical consequences? Could anything be gained? Yeah, it, it's another good question. Uh, it's when, when the EPA promulgated its current bottled water rule, uh, it did not conduct an environmental impact statement pursuant to the National Environmental Policy Act. I believe it should have. Uh, the issue was not raised at the time. Uh, I think it's very clear, even uh, just looking at the um, common agreement among the panelists, that bottled water withdrawals from springs certainly have the potential for significant environmental impacts, which is the threshold requirement for an environmental impact statement. And I think that if the FDA were to relook at that rule or reconsider it, or if there were a petition for rulemaking filed to the FDA, it would absolutely have to comply with NEPA and perform an environmental impact statement uh, in connection with its bottled water spring rule. Yeah, I think that's quite significant now in the, re in the wake of recent Supreme Court decisions narrowing the definition of navigable waters in the Clean Water Act. Have there been proposals to enact new legislation to expand Clean Water Act jurisdiction to the maximum that the Constitution permits? Do you believe that this legislation is advisable and will it make much of a difference for the types of disputes that we've heard about today? Uh, yes, Chairman, I do. I, I believe uh, it's Congressman Overstar and, and uh, my Congressman, Congressman Dingell, who've uh, led an effort to uh, enact the Clean Water Restoration Act which would extend, uh, which would make clear really that the federal government's jurisdiction over navigable waters extends to uh, all waters of the United States to the extent of the Commerce Clause of the Constitution. Uh, I think that is excellent legislation. That's how the Clean Water Act was enforced and applied for over 30 years. And uh, I'd hate to see us take a step back in, in the wake of the Supreme Court's recent Rapanos decision. Thank you, Professor Hall. Uh, Mr. Shays. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Chairman, thank you for having this hearing. I, I, I view water as, as precious as gold uh, in, in so many different ways, and um, it was not lost to me that foreign companies came and bought a number of water companies in the New England area uh, because they uh, bought it for the water and they bought it for the land because there's so much land that's reserved for, uh, um, to, to protect our, our water supply. I'm wrestling, though, with this topic uh, as it's designed against, uh, as it appears to be, focused on, on bottles of water. I, I look at Candlewood Lake in my state. Uh, I think uh, a lot of that water uh, goes to New York City. Um, and um, I'm wrestling with the fact that uh, water from Northern California goes to Southern California. I, I, I am, I'm wrestling with the fact that um, um, soda uses water. I'm, um, 
you know, Gatorade uses water, uh, and yet we're focused on the water company. I, you know, I'm tempted to ask you, Ms. Halter, if you, you would prefer, and do you think that, that uh, uh, Coca-Cola is better for me than drinking uh, water from a, uh, from a bottle? Is it better? No, no, I need you to you turn your mic on. I think Thank that you. what we believe is that it's a societal question. Do we want safe and affordable That's drinking not what I asked water? You. That's not what I asked you. I asked you specifically if you think the water in a Coca-Cola is better for you uh, than the water that would be pure. I think that that's a, a question, that it's an unfair question. No, no, it's not an unfair question. If you are going to come and testify before us and you are going to attack companies for making money, it's very fair. Otherwise, you are a meaningless witness and I shouldn't ask you any questions. Do you want to be relevant? Do you want to testify? Then answer the question. Please answer the question. I think that Coca-Cola is unhealthy and that drinking a glass of tap water is a better option than drinking right. bottled okay, water. Okay, now let me ask you this though. Why wouldn't you, why would you not have the concern? I, I, I guess I don't know, maybe Professor Hall. Where does Coca-Cola get its water from? Uh, Coca-Cola, um, both for the product Coke as well as for what I believe is their Dasani brand, primarily uses water from municipal water supply. So it takes, and that water doesn't, it isn't the same analogy apply to soda and beer that it would apply to, to uh, bottled water? Uh, in, some in, in some instances, yes, it does. For example, Coke, which primarily uh, sells bottled water that comes from municipal water supply, I believe it's Dasani is their brand name. I, I'm not talking bottled water. I'm just talking. Yeah, it's the same as Coke. I mean, it, it, so they are, they are depleting, in a sense, the water supply locally and distributing it nationwide. Correct. Yeah, okay. Um, water, basically, uh, I believe, is 1 50th percent of the water that we consume. A one, in other words, uh, it's, it's less than a percent. It's not one tenth of a percent. It's one fiftieth of a percent. So uh, in the realm of things, why should I be fo focused on this issue as opposed to the other 99%? Uh, that's an excellent question, Representative. I, I would say that uh, as I uh, hopefully made clear in my initial testimony, bottled water is a tiny mi microscopic use of the overall national water supply. And from a macro level, it's really not a major concern in terms of our water conservation and use. The concern is that um, spring water bottlers withdraw water from, by definition, springs, which are very small, vulnerable water resources, such that for So these are unique water systems that you're, you're, you're making the point about. Exactly. Okay. Let me ask you, um, in, in Stanford, Connecticut, uh, next door was Greenwich, Connecticut, is no Greenwich, Connecticut, Greenwich uh, American Water Company, I think the name of it, uh, was n didn't have enough supply. The bog reservoir they were going to pump from the ground and put into the into the pond into the lake, and then they were going to take it. And um, we realized in Connecticut that we didn't have anything that focused on uh, um, the, the water table. We just we focused on surface water. So what I did as a state legislator is I gave that right to the, the Department of Health. Why isn't this? Because I do think. Ms. Halter and others have an issue as it relates to uh, a locally confined area that may find its water table uh, being drawn down. Why wouldn't that just be a, 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 an issue that Maine, New Hampshire, and others should work out on their own without the federal government stepping in? Um, well, first off, uh, I'm pretty familiar with that region. I actually spent grew up in, in Ridgefield, right by Stanford and Greenwich. Do you Greenwich. have family that's still there? Uh, yeah, yes, sir. Oh, geez, I have to be on my best behavior. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, it's okay. Um, I just want to say you have been an excellent witness. <laughs> <laughs> and, and even though the gentleman's time has expired, since there is this local connection, I'll ask the <laughs> professor to answer the question. And uh, uh, thank you. And, and in all seriousness, it's an excellent question. Um, I think that primarily water use should be managed at the state and local level, and I think by and large state and local governments have done and are doing an excellent job of improving their management. Um, but however, the FDA through the spring water rule has created essentially a national market for some of the most vulnerable water resources in localities and states. 
And so this is a problem that in some part uh, was caused by the FDA and to some extent can be fixed by the FDA. Okay, just last, lastly though, I mean, if the state of New Hampshire or Maine or whatever uh, is concerned with what's happening with aquifers, what's happening with spring, uh, it does have the legal authority to step in, correct? Absolutely, yes. Yeah, yeah. Right. And I would just say that I hope it does in a constructive way, working with the bottlers and so on. Thank you. Thank you. I, I thank the gentleman. Uh, his time has expired. Uh, to Professor Heinemann, is there a difference from a hydrological perspective when you use groundwater for irrigation for agriculture versus using it for extraction for water, bo water bottling? The primary difference is exactly what Professor Hall just mentioned. I mean, groundwater is groundwater. If we're talking about shallow groundwater, the quality of much of the shallow groundwater across, say, the Midwest is, is fairly similar. The main difference in agricultural pumping is that's largely from deeper aquifer systems that are further down in a watershed. They're not in the headwaters of a watershed. Is one more damaging than the other? Yes, the spring water the pumping rather. is more damaging because of the fact that it's in the would headwaters. You, would you repeat that? Yes, the spring water is spring water pumping is more damaging, in my opinion, because it's done in the headwaters of watersheds. Because it's done in the headwaters of watersheds, right. in ecologically sensitive areas. Okay. Now, um, I, I'd like to ask uh, you one more question, but I'd also a like to ask Mr. Doss and uh, Ms. Howder to respond. Can, can people, and, and I've always wondered this, can people typically perceive a difference in taste and is there a quality of difference between FDA defined spring water and bottled water that does not technically meet the spring water designation? Professor Heinemann. For me that would be a, a, a personal choice and I, I personally tasting between the two of them in a blind tasting, I probably could not tell you if one is spring water versus not. Professor Hall? Uh, I, I doubt uh, the average person could tell the difference. And in fact, some municipalities like Evart, Michigan, uh, have as their municipal water, water that meets the FDA spring water definition. And uh, Ms. Outer? No, there have been many taste tests around the country and people have difficulty. Basically, bottled water is marketed on its packaging and its sex appeal and the, um, the claims that it's healthier, not taste. Sounds like a presidential campaign, uh, Mr. Dodd. <laughs> uh, it, it's a consumer choice. Obviously, some consumers may prefer tap water. Some consumers may prefer bottled water. Uh, we don't disparage tap water. Uh, we think if people are drinking water, that's a good thing because it's a very healthy product. Um, so again, it boils down to consumer choice. I can tell the difference in many bottled waters, just as I can tell the difference between tap water and, and other beverages. You're saying you can't or cannot? I can. You can? Absolutely. Really? Could we take um, a test right now? <laughs> <laughs> I said certainly. I'm, I'm just not saying kidding. I've all uh, of them, but I can certainly tell the kidding. taste difference in many bottled waters <laughs> that I drink. You know, you're, you're under oath, but you're absolutely. You know, we'll give you. Uh, I say that with. <laughs> we'll give your tongue an exemption. Uh, okay, um, Mr. Wilfong. Yes, I, I think there, you know, that there really isn't any difference. Um, the water just happens to hit a low point in the ground and bubbles up and out of it. Uh, it's all essentially the same water system. Okay, um, uh, to Professor Hin uh, Hinman. Heinemann, if the FDA changed its definition of spring water, you know, I'd, I'd like to ask Mr. Doss to answer this too so you can get ready. If the FDA changed its definition of spring water to include groundwater not immediately or in, and directly connected to a lake or stream, that is you don't have to draw down the spring when you uh, pump in order to sell it as spring water, would that alleviate the direct impacts in spring wetland surface water situations uh, like Mecosta, McLeod, New Hampshire and other locations where they've uh, uh, been having problems during lower precipitation, or there have been problems during lower precipitation or drought-like conditions? Thank you, Chairman. It's an excellent question. If the FDA changed the definition to include groundwater that is in the vicinity and even deeper groundwater, that could resolve the concern because the pumping would not be pushed into those headwater areas. And in fact, you could do hydrogeologic studies that would basically define the best areas to put this pumping where it would have minimal impact. Mr. Doss, would you like to respond? I to that? think uh, the issue really goes back to the question of sustainability at the state level. When a state uh, grants a permit for a bottled water company to withdraw that water, 
They should take into consideration all the science involved. They should take into consideration all of those concerns that have been raised here today by these professors. And if they decide that the uh, water uh, source is not sustainable for the bottled water plant, then they should deny the plant uh, the ability to pump water from that particular source. So I think it gets back to sustainability. Well, I'd, I'd like to just go uh, and ask every uh, member of this panel a um, question from your written and oral testimony. There seems to be broad support for the proposition that the uh, USGS should be empowered and funded to assume a much greater role in groundwater mapping and monitoring. And if this is so, why hasn't it, it been done yet and what political obstacles stand in the way of that reform? Ms. Howder. Uh, I think it's something that's been overlooked and there's been a lack of funding for and that we have to get busy. And it's not just for bottling, um, for bottled water, but we need to do it for a range of water issues uh, from agriculture to uh, uh, industry. Professor Heinemann. I think that the issues go beyond just mapping for the U.S. Geological Survey. In fact, it's very important for the funding for the USGS to have monitoring of surface water. It is an incredible network that the U.S. Geological Survey has across the country, but the funds have continually been cut. They have to keep going back to cooperators for money. And personally, when I do research on broad scales to try to figure out the impacts of things like climate change and land use change, it's very difficult when these USGS gauges go offline or mm -hmm. you know, a new one will start up somewhere else because that's where a cooperator has an interest. If we don't maintain the network for the type of science we're talking about, it's very difficult to talk about what the impacts will be. Thank you, Professor Hall. Look, the, the, the truth is that uh, the doing the scientific work, gathering information, the research, it's not sexy. Uh, it doesn't capture the public's imagination. The work that Professor Heinemann does, the work that I do, the work the USGS does um, is often overlooked. Uh, and that's unfortunate because really that information is, is the, foundation for <coughs> the foundation for making good decisions. And so uh, I think one of the most important things that, that this committee could do would be to strongly recommend more funding and support for USGS. Thank you, Mr. Doss. I think I would say that we have a consensus here that decisions need to be made on sound science, and um, I would agree with that. And IBWA has supported the um, enactment of the 21st Century Water Commission, which will help uh, those federal agencies share data with the states that can allow the states to make more informed decisions, have better science, and we think that's a great thing. And we support passage of that federal legislation and think that's a proper role for the federal government. Thank you, Mr. Hen Mr. Wilfong. Yes, I would agree with uh, all that's been said. We, uh, we need a lot of uh, help, uh, especially in the smaller communities uh, that are, have few financial resources to be able to take a hard look at, at, the, uh, um, at the groundwater situation. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Uh, Heinemann, uh, we showed a photo of the dead stream that a first panel witnessed from Nestle, and this photo was taken at a time after Nestle began pumping in uh, Michigan. Uh, my staff was informed that this photo was shown to Nestle. Um, what, what did you think the photo shows? What do you think it shows? This is the mud flats in front of the Doyles property, and the Doyles were involved in that case. And during this summer, as well as at least one previous summer, the conditions went to a point where the levels had fallen below what had been observed prior to pumping. And it's a situation where the pumping that is occurring is drawing down the water level beyond what the natural conditions would be. So therefore, the impacts are exacerbated by the pumping that Nestle well, has. So was this, was this beavers that did this? No, this is not beavers. This is a low water How do level. you know? How do you know it wasn't beavers? Because I'm very aware with what's happening at this site, and there has been a beaver dam intermittently down below this site. If a beaver How many beavers would it take to do that? Uh, I'm not sure how many, okay. how many beavers. <laughs> <laughs> Thought I'd ask. <laughs> okay. Um, is there, uh, uh, Ms. Howder, is there a connection between what you see as a threat of privatization of public water resource and the deterioration of the public uh, water infrastructure? Could there be some sort of taxation scheme by which either consumers or producers of water products uh, fund improvements to the public infrastructure, such as the Clean Water Fund that you propose in your written testimony? 
Yes, this is one of our main concerns with bottled water. It, it, because it's sold as safer, because we no longer see public water fountains being built, uh, we're concerned that it's actually undermining our public water systems. And we do generally have very safe and affordable drinking water, but we have real infrastructure problems. And um, every year there's a $22 billion deficit. And in the future, in the very uh, near future, if we don't have more federal investment in our water infrastructure, we could be in a situation where uh, there isn't safe and affordable drinking water. So we would like to see that public commitment to safe drinking water grow, and uh, we do need a Clean Water Trust Fund to do that. Thank you very much. I want to thank all the witnesses. Uh, I'm Dennis Kucinich, Chairman of the Domestic Policy Subcommittee, the Oversight and Government Reform Committee. This has been a hearing on assessing the environmental risk of the water bottling industry's extraction. Uh, I want to thank all of the witnesses from the first and the second panel for their cooperation. The subcommittee will be in uh, uh, correspondence with you to follow up on some of the points that were raised today. I want to thank the staff on both sides for uh, their participation, Mr. Issa for his cooperation. And uh, without uh, further discussion, this committee stands adjourned.